were asked to present together, um, it really made a good deal of sense because um, although our, our take is a little bit different, it is really about how do you engage people in the community by asking questions and listening. And in Vermont, we started a listening project. This was last summer. Um, it was really, we tend to do a number of parades over the course of the year across the state. It's a statewide chapter, we're very spread out. So, you know, those are some of the times where we come together and really have the opportunity to interact with people in the community. And one of our members, um, Richard, he brought a clipboard and it was a clipboard like this and it said, how do you foster peace on the back? He had a sign. And while we were waiting for the parade to start, he actually just started walking around with everybody else who was waiting for the parade and just asking them the question, how do you foster peace? And it was very interesting, the responses. Sometimes people just didn't even know what the question meant. They were like, what, what, do, you, what do you mean? And so, um, because it was our thought really that oftentimes we're going out and we're telling people what we think is Veterans for Peace. And sometimes you do get the people with the glaze over eyes and they just, you know, it's something either they've heard before or they aren't interested in hearing it. And to flip it around and instead of us telling people what we think they should know, asking people to really think through for themselves thoughts about what peace means for them. And so, oftentimes people wouldn't know what we were talking about, and so I would often then prompt. So we did this at a parade, and then I went to my Randolph Area Peace Coalition and asked them if they wanted to do it, because I thought it was a fantastic way to engage the community. And we went to three different community events. We went to a, a county fair and walked around and asked people how they foster peace. We went to um, a filming of Michael Moore's new documentary and asked people there while they were waiting in line. We went to a bike race and asked people at the finish line um, what they thought about the question, how do you foster peace? And we actually did our first workshop. Um, it was a part of the Building a World Beyond War workshop series with David Swanson that came through up in Burlington, oh, a few months ago. And so as part of that workshop, I actually just went around and we similarly kind of, you know, explored the question, how do you foster peace? And I guess I would just pose that question to the group and see where the conversation takes us. And in Milwaukee, um, there's a, a place for veterans to meet called the Dry Hoop. Um, it was started by a Vietnam veteran. And uh, we just spontaneously uh, created um, a fi Friday support group, one hour a week on Friday, and we all get together. And boy, I'll tell you, I, I initially came with the, with the purpose of transforming these people into Veterans for Peace uh, members. You know, that was, that was but I learned real quickly that, no, my main purpose is to not judge, to listen. And so that's the way I do it. I, that's the way I foster peace is listening. Yes. Our chapter for the past two years has sponsored a, uh, a scholarship program for area high school students and college students in the Evansville area, where we present, the chapter comes up with about four questions about peace. This would be an excellent question to pose to them, but things like, uh, uh, what does Vietnam mean to you? Uh, questions that sort of expand their horizon to get them to think about and write about peace. They submit their essays and then they're subject to a blind review within the chapter. And at the end of that process, we award a thousand dollar check, uh, an unfettered, unrestricted check to the winning student. And we do the presentation on Armistice Day to further add emphasis to the notion of peace. Now, that doesn't do a lot 
to expand the conversation into the broad community, but we are seeing evidence that it does make a difference within classes of school students and within uh, buildings where the last winter, for example, happens to be at one of our charter schools, and many of the teachers in that charter school were quite uh, complimentary about that process and the effect that it had on some of their discussions in their classes. So I guess the point of that is that sometimes it's the little things rather than the big, splashy, explosive things that can really make a difference for individuals. Uh, I try to be kind and loving to everybody on me, even if they're conservative. I try to be kind and loving to everybody on me, conservative or not, you know, treat everybody with respect, even though it's difficult to do when people we differ so extremely. But, uh, and I, 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 you know, I, I, that's happened uh, more recent than in the last few years because initially I was very aggressive about it and raised, you know, a level of uh, intolerance between us that, you know, was, was difficult and turned people away and pissed people off. And just being able to listen to them and, and what they think and question them, you know, about it, things that, uh, that I have a real concern about uh, just, just, just being a little more laid back with people, you know. So, so. Um, I like to go into conversations with, uh, with knowing that I can challenge. I'm going to challenge my own assumptions about what I think about the world. I'm open to change. Uh, I'm not very good at multitasking, but I manage a small farmers market in Dewitt, Iowa, and I've been thinking about essentially setting up a like a vending stand uh, where I can both uh, you know, talk with people about farmers market businesses and, but also uh, have a banner saying uh, finding peace of mind and using techniques and uh, processes like we were describing today with people who just drop by after, after they've been shopping for produce and whatnot maybe having some posters set up, uh, providing some uh, food for thought on various issues. Uh, Bernal, um, I actually could be done in New Orleans right now for the Vietnam Vets of America Convention. But unfortunately this year, they put it the same week yeah. as the Vets for Peace. Yeah. Now I usually go down there, I've been to the last four or five. I'm a subversive down there. I pack my bag full of stuff. <laughs> I need this stuff all over in the lobbies. <laughs> Anytime time I get in a conversation with somebody, it's always a blessing. But you know, I gotta go to my Vets for Peace convention because you know, I mean, this is on my own time. That one would have been fully paid. But you know, I, I, I have much more affinity for all the people I see at these conventions, uh, Vets for Peace ones. Uh, our chapter, um, we table a lot at community events. Uh, the way we raised money for the past 15 years is we gave away a cedar strip canoe, handmade cedar strip canoe. But at the same time, we got a table full of literature. So this has been what we've been doing for years. And um, and then we've got a speaker's bureau. And uh, so our chapter is pretty good about getting out there. I keep working on this, the Vietnam Vets of America people that I've talked to. I may get, you know, we got the convention next year. So I'm hoping I get some of these guys to come to the convention. But you know, you just gotta keep talking and, and you know, I. I'm a little more calm with these people than they get with strangers and get in my face about stuff. But you know, so I, you just keep working at it, and see, we get more people. We're, our chapter is growing by bits and pieces. We've got, I think, probably at least uh, probably six or eight new members just since the beginning of the year. So it works. It works. You know. Yeah. Well, I have a couple thoughts. Um, uh, I was sitting right across from me is Jerry. And uh, Jerry is the president of uh, the Asheville chapter 099. And um, one of the things that, that we started uh, under um, another fellow, James Lattimore, is that we started going to the vets meetings, which were once a month, which are once a month, and they represent the American Legion, the Veterans of Foreign Wars, um, and other organizations. And when I, I was president after Lattimore, and the first words out of their mouth is, here come the commies. <laughs> and uh, uh, and uh, because back in that time, I guess communism was still you know, the, the bad guy. 
So we would come in, and, and uh, a fellow who is now deceased, uh, um, my vice president, who became president, um, Ron, Ron uh, Hereda, uh, he and I would go in, and, and here's what I want to say about it. The human brain is made up of the cognition, emotions, behavior, and some would add a fourth, spiritual. Uh, I don't see that. I see three. You must talk to people on an emotional level, which, by the way, presents a big problem because emo how do you talk about love until you get into cognition? So, you know, you either feel this love, this emotion, or this anger, or this hate, or the, whatever emotion you can engender, right? Whatever comes to you. And then you gotta find ways to go back up here to put it into words if you wanna talk about it. But you must, don't, don't take the word must, take the word must out. You can look at the notion of getting to people's emotions. So what happened at that group, the guy who used to call me Kami all the time, his wife died. And no one else did this that I saw. I went up to him and I hugged him. And I, because it was, it was so emotional. And do you know what? He stopped calling me Kami. <laughs> uh, he, uh, he called me, no, something, never mind. But anyway, um, and so we would go to the stand downs and we began a dialogue. Last thing, I, I don't live in, a La in um, Asheville anymore. I live in a little village in Alaska called Willow. And everybody has guns. <laughs> they carry the guns, they walk around, they shoot. They, they I mean, they're all they kind of- They kill bears. Well, bears. yes ma'am, exactly. But they, they <clears throat> it's their ambiance. It is who they are. And I refuse to have a gun. I had enough guns for 14 years, I don't want any more guns. And they get on me. <laughs> they, I mean, it's, it's a visceral thing. You gotta have a gun! Just because of what the lady said. You, what, what happens if a bear comes up? I said, if the bear kills me, hey, I lived a good life. <laughs> uh, You'd make a good meal, too. It's, tomorrow night will be the banquet. Guess who's on the on, on being fed to you? <laughs> but anyway, anyway, I, so I just, I, I just, I, I just want to leave you with the thought that we need to get to people on a different level than cognition. Thank you. I just. Yeah. Yeah, I just want to, when you bring up this idea of emotion, it refers to the section that you were, the content of the section we were talking about earlier. That's how we get a lot of the kids be, and adults because we appeal to the emotion to join because you're going to sacrifice. It's all idealistic language as well as what we see in the behavior. We, the only way we know how to consider defense has to do with violence, but we don't say that. You're gonna save your country. I hate the idea that we serve the country we don't serve the country people, we serve the people who have investments in arms. Yep. But the idea that we're serving the country people, people of the country, is no another part of the lie. And we keep saying it, I serve my country. No, you serve part of your country, but not all of them. Um, anyway, so I think this idea about the emotion, we appeal to the emotion to get people into the military, and then we expect the physical expression of that idealism, <coughs> loyalty, uh, band of brothers kind of thing by the behavior. That's my take on that. So um, a few hands going up, we'll go kind of around this gentleman, and then you, and then you, and then Dan. Sorry, I don't quite have everybody's hands on right. Jerry. <laughs> well, John actually gave me the intro. I was going to say that uh, since he left Asheville, the uh, BFP membership in the, in the county veterans council went by the wayside. 
Um, so I reinstituted it once I became president, and I went. And there obviously there was some lingering doubts about our purposes in being there, as John could probably he kind of alluded to. And uh, so the first meeting I went to, I was largely ignored until the end, and they finally begrudgingly, you know, acknowledged that Veterans for Peace was now a member of the Buncombe County Veterans Council again. And I asked for like a 10 minute window on the next meeting to uh, reintroduce us to the group. So the group is like John described, VFW, American Legion, Marine Corps League, all of whom are doing the good work of advocating for veterans to be found and to be given the services they require in the community, the ones that have become disillusioned with the VA and have gone off the grid or working to get those people taken <coughs> care of. So it's all this kind of stuff. But there's, you know, I already picked up on the fact that they don't really consider the absence of war or to be a possibility in the world. I mean, they just, it's just a foregone conclusion that we're just gonna keep fighting, 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 creating more disabled and, and you know, like Daniel, you know, and, and people like that. <clears throat> so I just did like a 10 minute spiel and I said, you know, you may think we're crazy. I said, somebody's gotta be focused on peace. And in our community, in our world, Veterans for Peace are those people, you know, because as I talked about some of the facts you know, 800, you know, military bases abroad, what's that about, the amount of money we spend, all this stuff. Um, I was getting the glazed eyeballs, you know, <laughs> like, uh, you know. And so it was kind of disconcerting, but I wrapped it up and, you know, I said, because I gave them my little military bio, you know, I'm Marine Corps and Army National Guard, just to try to establish some credibility. And, um, so at the end, I said, you may think we're crazy, but somebody's got to be trying to do this, or if nobody's doing it, it's never going to happen at all. And so that was that. And it was towards the end of the meeting, as I was packing up my stuff to leave, three of them came up to me privately <laughs> and told me that they were on board with what I was talking about. There you go. Privately. Yeah. Privately. <laughs> right because they didn't obviously want to embarrass themselves in the larger group by being commies. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, but, and here's the thing. It's very important. One of them said, well, he says, I'll join Veterans for Peace, but you have to join the Marine Corps League. <laughs> so you have to be willing to go into the belly of the beast. Because this guy, he was desperate for somebody that spoke like I did about war in the Marine Corps League because they're all Trumpsters and he says it's making his head want to explode when he goes to Marine Corps League meetings. So I've been traveling ever since, but I've pledged to him when I get back to Asheville next month, I'm gonna join the Marine Corps League uh -oh. and we're gonna go in and we're just gonna, you know, you gotta go for it. Go for it. Semper Fi. Immerse yourselves yeah. and change it from the inside. But that's, you know, Good for you, Jerry. I'm Des Cohn in Chicago. Uh, I think we're experiencing here what a rich question this is and how it generates a, a, a lot of reflection. Um, I follow uh, President Eisenhower and his mandate to monitor the military industrial complex. That's a sense of calling that I have right now. And uh, I think my uh, uh, monitoring answers some of the questions that have been floated here today. And that is that the military industrial complex has a professional well-financed organization that's out there starting new wars all the time. Uh, uh, probably finances the rate of about 60 billion a year. It's called CIA. And they are out there looking for the next war. And that's why we apparently don't learn from history because we have an institutionalized force that's out there creating new wars all the time. Thank you. <coughs> Um, in conversations with people about peace and war, one, one thing that happens is 
they the, the political ritual of saying thank you for your service. Oh, yeah. Uh, and I, for the life of me, cannot think of a response to that that's not snarky. Can anyone help me? Yes. I mean, I get I get that every day because of my shirt mainly. People see that I'm a veteran, and this morning up on the 23rd floor. Um, a mother sitting there with her husband and two children I went out of her way to say thank you for your Oh, she said I love your t-shirt and thank you for your service and my response is always thank you for your sentiment and let them know that I appreciate their recognition <coughs> but I said please think about who we are really serving <coughs> and 90 some percent of the time shake their head, I know what you mean, you know? Yeah. So, so they're, they're aware, they're, they're aware, but you've got to let them know you appreciate it, yeah. you're recognizing yeah. what we're going through. What is your comment? Well, the thing is, being in the Bible Belt of North Carolina, although Asheville is known as a cesspool of sin, <laughs> uh, the larger, uh, you moved there, larger uh, uh, Christian community. <laughs> But uh, I often get the thank you for your service and I get my discounted blows or whatever else. And this goes towards spirituality, but basically I'll say, well, you can really thank me for my service by praying for peace. Uh, yeah, great, well, great, often, great response. Too often, though, people, like, I get three reactions. One is amen, you know, because they're into it. They understand. Second, I get the glazed eyeballs, like no reaction whatsoever. And then, unfortunately, I have had the reaction where, well, it's not going to do any good because there's never going to be peace. Yeah. Which is the saddest of them all, I think, you know. But it's short to the point, it hits most of the, you know, hits the target, and, you know. People change their mind when they're actually talking versus when you're talking to them and they're, because they're listening and they're processing stuff. And one of the things, and I never met, I never meant the Socratic method uh, model, but I was a counselor for a while and we used uh, this motivational interviewing model, whereas all you do is they say something and you, do, you reflect what they've said and it prompts more from them and you just keep doing that <clears throat> and you keep drawing more out from them versus giving your opinion or your perspective and allow them, <clears throat> I think basically to hear themselves talk and hear, hear what their position is. And it's really interesting, because I, I, I worked in drug rehab for a while, and, and it really works well. Because if you tell someone to stop smoking crack or shooting dope, they're, they're, their eyes glaze over, and it's like, <laughs> you know, maybe in 40 years. But if you let them, like, sort of tell if they live that long, <laughs> if they talk and they tell themselves this story, then they start hearing, this shit is crazy. Mm -hmm. You know, from themselves, not from, a, you're just another person telling them what to do, what not to do. And, and it's really been helpful in VFP because you get those sort of right-leaning people and, and let them talk. And you know, they may not change their mind then, but pretty soon it's like, wow, that, this shit sounds like crazy eventually. But it has to be done in their own, in, you know, you can't change a person. You have to, they'll, they'll do it in their own time if they're yeah. gonna do it at all. I'll try and be brief. My response to thank you for your service, I've thought about this a lot like you have, and I, I always have, sort of have a one sentence, although it's flexible response. I said, thank you for your sentiment. The way you can thank me for my service is to work to prevent war. Mm -hmm. And I get the three reactions, the eyes glazed over, or, oh, that, that's good. Uh, you, and I, I've had several reactions in Chicago here saying, we're, you know, people in the street, we're against war. But I did want to reflect on the question of the facilitator of how do we focus on peace best way. And I, I've heard a little bit of skepticism about religion around the circle, and I want to speak up for religion in this uh, respect of creating and focusing on peace. Uh, I believe the churches, the mainline churches, have been leaders in the peace movement. Way back in clergy and laity concern, of which Martin Luther King was a member, clergy and laity concern was, was the tip of the spear in the peace movement against the Vietnam War. Uh, more recently, uh, I was a part of 700 clergy that were arrested 
on the run-up to the Iraq War. I was arrested with a Methodist bishop in front of the White House, and that, that got very little press co coverage. 700 clergy arrested in front of the White House on wow. March 19th, 2003, the eve of shock and awe. And uh, I believe if the Pope, I'm not Catholic, but if the Pope had, had flown to Baghdad and just sat there mm -hmm. the night of March 19th, that might have averted the war. But acts of courage like that and acts of courage like Martin Luther King, uh, I believe that, that peace is both an inner journey of creating our own peace within and also peace without, of working for social justice without. One of my critiques of Buddhism is that I, not, not never, but I rarely see a Buddhist leader involved in social justice action. Yes, um, we talked about emotion here today in reaction to some of our ideas and concepts. And uh, I don't know whether you've experienced this, but the word peace, when I've expressed it, oftentimes uh, actually made people's hair stand on end. Well, not my case, uh, but. <laughs> <laughs> We, in San Diego, decided we would approach one of the universities to have an on-campus chapter of the Veterans for Peace. Mm -hmm. And so we made, we made a presentation, and uh, the faculty said, uh, yeah, we'll entertain that idea, but here's the deal. You have to remove the word Peace. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> <That's exactly. laughs> Using the surprise approach, I asked, word. why do you say that? You're right. <laughs> and they said, you know, That's peace right. is, a, is political. It's like running along the third rail. So if you want to come on campus, you have to remove the word peace. So we said we wouldn't do it. And um, they did finally put together a room with computers, and it had veterans on it. We were we were asked to come to the breaking of the ribbon and things like that, but they made it very clear that we weren't welcome. We went to the dean and said, "This is a university. The word peace. I can't understand how that'd be controversial." I agree with the faculty. No, no, no. I'm not going to use the word peace. It's, it is too controversial. <laughs> uh, this, is a, this is a place of higher learning. So, what campus was this? So, yeah, what campus? And, uh, I'm not going to mention it. Okay. Because, uh, they're trying to do the best they can. That's their position. I respect their choice, but I don't agree. So we have about, um, just doing a time check, about 13 minutes, and I did want to reserve a few at the end just to talk with you a little bit about, you know, somebody commented that, yeah, we're all people of a very particular mindset and, and um, you know, organizing uh, background and have been doing this for different lengths of time. Conversations go so differently when you just talk with people walking down the street. Um, and so I wanted to share, take a few minutes to, to share with you what some of those conversations went like. But I will do another round. Um, and I had seen that people who were just wanting to have a last comment could raise their hand again. I think I caught folks. I want to make sure I get everybody. Perfect. All right. Um, two comments. One, I think the question that you mentioned, or the statement, the question that we talked about earlier you might ask people, instead of working for peace, is how do you prevent war? That might, how, how in your life do you prevent war? Mm -hmm. Might be a really good question for the man on the street. Like but in they, my family, or? Yeah, well, <laughs> we have a, a saying in our family, the reason the Irish fight one another is because there are no other worthy opponents. <laughs> <laughs> November 17th, but there's a big push in November 
for people who have or have not been in Veterans for Peace or who've gone to a Jesuit university or who are Catholics to get ROTC out of Jesuit universities because they're humongous. Mm -hmm. And even when I offered full scholarship for people who were in Notre Dame, which is not a Jesuit college,